I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join us on our quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, a podcast in search of all that moves us beyond words. I shall never experience such a feeling of complete isolation from the surface of the planet Earth as when I first dangled in a hollow pea on a swaying cobweb a quarter of a mile below the deck of a ship rolling in mid-ocean. The year is 1930. The great age of polar exploration is over. Outer space awaits the coming generation. Yet for this generation of the early 20th century, there is still a frontier to challenge. The ocean deeps remain untouched, and to reach them, William Beebe, already a famed nature writer and naturalist, crouches in a cramped steel sphere sloshing on a steel cable. 383 feet. We are passing the deepest submarine record. 525 feet. A diver in an armored suit descended this far into a Bavarian lake, the deepest point a live human has ever reached. 600 feet. Only dead men have descended deeper than this. B.B. peers through a thick quartz window designed to withstand the enormous pressure of the deep ocean. Scrunched next to him is Otis Barton, the engineer who designed and built the diving ball, which B.B. has dubbed the bathysphere. From 1930 to 1934, in dive after dive, the two men sink deeper and deeper into the ocean depths. William B.B. sees things none had seen, and he struggles to describe them in his 1934 book titled Half Mile Down. 700 feet. We were the first living men to look out at the strange illumination, and it was stranger than any imagination could have conceived. It was of an inconceivable translucent blue, quite unlike anything I've ever seen in the upper world, and it excited our optic nerves in a most confusing manner. We kept thinking and calling it brilliant. And again and again, I picked up a book to read the type, only to find that I could not tell the difference between a blank page and a colored plate. I brought all logic to bear. I put out of mind the excitement of our position in watery space and tried to think sanely of comparative colors. And I failed utterly. I flashed on the searchlight, which seemed the yellowest thing I had ever seen, and let it soak into my eyes. Yet the moment it was switched off, it was like the long vanished sunlight. It was as though it had never been. And the blueness of the blue, both inside and outside our sphere, seemed to pass materially through the eye into our very beings. That blueness of the blue was so unworldly that Bibi later said, for him, the warm glow of the bright yellow sun had lost its power. Nothing the sun had to offer in yellow could outdo that bluest blue he had witnessed. It was just one of a handful of moments with color and light in the bathysphere that literally left Bibi dumbfounded. My first encounter with Bibi probably 20 years ago, was finding that passage from Half Mile Down, which describes him coming up. The first encounter with that limit of the sun, watching the blue fade to black, and then as he's emerging into the afternoon light back on the deck of the ship, understands that something about his perception has been forever changed. That's Brad Fox, who has written about William Beebe in The Bathysphere Book, Effects of the Luminous Ocean Depths. To me, that matter of having seen not even a creature, but just something about light and color that would change you forever was part of what lodged itself in my imagination and and made me interested in seeing what this was all about. We'll be leaning on Brad Fox as we consider the William Beebe story, 
which includes his history-making bathysphere adventures, but in this episode of Constant Wonder, we'll be seeing more of the natural world than just the hidden depths of the ocean through Bibi's eyes. We are going to include his encounters with wonders in upper realms of light and on dry land. His celebrated career included hunting pheasants in South Asia, observing army ants in South America, tussling with sharks along coral reefs, these adventures all foreshadowed and paved Bibi's path to the ocean deep. But we thought it best to introduce you to this famous naturalist in the moments of descent when he was first gobsmacked by the blueness of the blue waters where light begins to lose its hold completely. Here's Brad Fox again. Right from the first dives, he was completely blown away by the effects of light and color as he descended. Very early on, he started bringing down a meter that would gauge what parts of the spectrum were dominant. He also brought these color cards that he would kind of hold up and see as they got deeper. The colors that were being absorbed by the depths would disappear. So yeah, it starts with oranges and reds, and eventually the last color to disappear is this kind of blue, black. And so he would be, you know, holding it. He's like, okay, orange is gone. Okay, green is gone, you know, as, they, as they're being absorbed. And then right at the moment when the sunlight was about to disappear completely, he found a strange sense of luminosity that he felt like the sea was bright. And it seemed counterintuitive. All of a sudden, it seemed as if the light increased right before it was going to disappear. And so he was trying to figure out what was going on with that. And I, when I was looking through his papers, you see these scientific papers about optics that he's reading, trying to understand h how that could be. This is all very unscientific, quite worthy of being jeered at by optician or physicist. But there it was. I was excited by the fishes that I was seeing, perhaps more than I have ever been by other organisms. But... It was only an intensification of my surface and laboratory interest. I have seen strange fluorescence and ultraviolet illumination in the laboratory of physicists. I recall the weird effects of color shifting through distant snow crystals on the high Himalayas, and I have been impressed by the eerie illumination or lack of it during a full eclipse of sun. But this was beyond and outside all or any of these. I think we both experienced a wholly new kind of mental reception of color impression. So, Brad, I think I need to emphasize here the subtitle of your book. It's The Effects of the Luminous Ocean Depths. The Effects. Uh, particularly on him as a scientist. He's a guy who, from his earliest youth, he is intent on learning and grasping and gaining knowledge. And here he is going down in that bathysphere, this unworldly blue that he writes about. It gets just swallowed up in the blackest black. Then there's that momentary increase in light that we've heard about. This whole thing is super unsettling to him, it seems. He is no match for what he's witnessing suddenly. It, it sounds to me like that's a pivotal experience. Well, I'm going to say more than pivotal experience. It's a crisis for him, and that goes right to his intellectual and spiritual jugular. Exactly, to the point where he starts to doubt empiricism, starts to doubt science. He doesn't know what it means to observe and what he can possibly transfer of his experience. That subtitle, exactly as you point out, what happens to you after that moment? BB never went down into the deep ocean again after the bathysphere dives and lived another 25 years. It's as if that experience was so unsettling and mind-boggling, also so beautiful that it seemed to be that he was living in its after effects, which was part of what I was interested in investigating. When we reached 1,700 feet, I hung there for a time and made as thorough a survey as possible. The most concentrated gazing showed no hint of blue left. All outside was black, 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 and none of my instruments revealed the faintest glimmer to my eye. I had now attained one of the chief objects of this whole dive, namely, to get below the level of humanly visual light. I was beyond sunlight, as far as the human eye could tell, and from here down, for two billion years, there had been no day or night, no summer or winter, no passing of time until we came to record it. 
1,800 and 1,900 feet were not blacker. That were impossible. But the complete dark seemed more tangible. Not a ray of light illumined the inside of the bathysphere. Bibi, while not a religious person, seemed to be drawn by this kind of experiences that short circuit his cognitive faculties that are beyond thought and language and that bring him to this point where he no longer knows who he is or what anything is. There is the moment in Half Mile Down where he says something to the effect of, I am a quarter mile below the ocean surface and there is a luminous fish outside the window. That is the entirety of my contribution to science. You know, he's kind of laughing at the potential meaninglessness of everything that he's done. William Beebe was overwhelmed by those experiences, sometimes unable to express what he had seen and felt. Now, Beebe may have occasionally been baffled or bewildered, startled or stunned, but he was never bored. Boredom was anathema to him. Henry Fairfield, who for 28 years was president of the New York Zoological Society, worked closely with Beebe. He recounted how a researcher once wrote to Beebe, hoping to participate on an expedition, and as part of the request, this correspondent mentions that his current research job is boring. According to Fairfield, Beebe's reply was this. Boredom is immoral. All about us. Nature puts on the most thrilling adventure stories ever created. But we have to use our eyes. I was walking across our compound last month when a queen termite began building her miraculous city. I saw it because I was looking down. One night, three giant fruit bats flew over the face of the moon, and I saw them because I was looking up. To some men, the jungle is a tangled place of heat and danger, but to the man who can see, its vines and plants form a beautiful and carefully ordered tapestry. No. I don't want any bored men around me. Even as a boy, William Beebe knew that he wanted to become an ornithologist. Born in 1877, reared in New Jersey, by his teens he was already engaged in field work, doing what bird scientists of his era were wont to do, killing, stuffing, and cataloging every variety of available fowl. To be fair... Beebe would later express some ambivalence about these methods. He felt deeply the paradox of killing and collecting the creatures he loved. And the next time you raise your gun to needlessly take a feathered life, think of the marvelous little engine which your lead will stifle forever. Lower your weapon and look into the clear, bright eyes of the bird whose body equals yours in physical perfection and whose tiny brain can generate a sympathy a love for its mate, which in sincerity and unselfishness suffers little when compared with human affection. His curiosity was never limited to birds. In the summer of 1898, while a student at Columbia University, Beebe led an expedition to Nova Scotia to collect specimens of birds, insects, fish, and other animal life. In his free time that summer in Nova Scotia, Beebe took up sailing. He peered into the water and felt it pulling him. From his sailboat, he launched a lifelong hobby of dredging, using nets to discover and describe creatures from the deep. He wrote in his journal about working while out in the sailboat with his close friend, William Seward. Dredging is the most fascinating work I have ever done. It keeps the excitement up to the highest pitch all the time no one knowing what will come up in the next hall. There was a long, heavy swell, and the dredge weighed a good deal, but we had a magnificent time. Seward would be feverishly examining a new specimen with a hand lens when a wave would throw him flat into a mass of sponges and the like in the bottom of the boat. After leaving Columbia University, William Beebe began work for the New York Zoological Society, and soon thereafter found himself circling the globe, researching and collecting birds, That expedition resulted in his massive and definitive work on pheasants. He also helped pioneer the modern field of ecology while in the South American tropics. But for all of this work on land, he never forgot the ocean, and dredging remained a passion. Here he is writing in 1906. In the depth of the sea, 
where the sun is powerless to send a single ray of light and warmth, there live many strange beings, fish and worms, which by means of phosphorescent spots and patches may light their own way. Of these strange sea folk, we know nothing except from the fragments brought to the surface by the dredge. B.B. had incredible powers of attention. He observed nature in its minute particularities, describing everything with passion and precision. His vivid writing for popular magazines and scientific journals made him something of a public celebrity. He was even able to forge friendships with the wealthy and the powerful, becoming especially close to President Theodore Roosevelt. How'd that happen? Well, B.B.'s mentor at Columbia had introduced the two to each other in 1908. And with that important social connection, it's now time to touch on an awkward aspect of the William B.B. story. You may recall something about Teddy Roosevelt's racial attitudes and imperialist policies. Such attitudes were in the air as B.B. was carving out his career. So how sympathetic or even open to these ideas was he? Here's Brad Fox again. That was his milieu, his funders, Theodore Roosevelt, who believed the only good Indian was a dead Indian. The people that supported him from early on in his career were central to the eugenics movement. They were conservationists, but they were also Madison Grant campaigning for forceful sterilization of minorities. I mean, they were villains, absolute villains. They're central to that part of not only American history, but world history because Madison Grant's book about eugenics was a big effect on Hitler. He called the book his Bible. In the Nuremberg trials, they used the writings of Madison Grant as a defense where the Nazis were saying that they were just implementing the ideas of prominent Americans. B.B. dedicated his book, Half Mile Down, all about his deep-sea ventures in the bathosphere, to this Madison Grant you've just heard named. Grant was a notable conservationist and leading figure in the Sierra Club. He was also a confirmed racist and eugenicist. His pseudo-scientific book from 1916, The Passing of the Great Race, is one of the most notorious white supremacist texts ever written. It's the volume that prompted Hitler, even before Hitler had risen to political prominence or power, to send an appreciative letter to Grant, saying that the book had become his Bible. There's little evidence that B.B. thought or spoke out much about any of these issues, and there is some evidence that he later came to think better about the shoulder rubbing that he had done formerly with people who espoused these worldviews. B.B. did seem to change his feelings over the course of his life. And then by the 40s, he is signing on to an open letter to Congress, an opposition to racial prejudice of any kind. He does seem to have had a change of heart to some degree. Historical figures are complex, so are living figures. It's, it's difficult to grasp fully thoughts and motives of people living today, let alone from a century ago. We are talking about legendary naturalist and deep-sea explorer William Beebe of Bathysphere fame. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. In 1910, William Beebe set out on a world voyage to conduct research for his definitive work on pheasants. His financial backer was a New Jersey millionaire and pheasant lover. The expedition took 17 months as they wandered through the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, and the Far East as far as Japan. It was in South Burma that Beebe experienced complete demoralization in a mental collapse. When I reached the elevated bungalow at Pungatong, I felt exhilarated and fit. Before the first night was over, I knew the horrors of acute nervous breakdown. It is probable that only explorers will really comprehend what I mean when waking fears and sleeping terrors combine to kill every enthusiasm and desire for work. The thought of going on was impossible. I hated pheasants, the jungle and all its inmates. I lit my candle lantern and roamed around the bungalow, trying to estimate in how few days I could make my return. I even felt no shame at quitting. To quit, and to quit at once, was all. Bibi didn't quit. 
He later published an exhaustive and well-received volume on pheasants. He would eventually come to love the jungle again, but he would never again spend so much time and effort focused on such a narrow topic. Theodore Roosevelt urged Bibi away from that. Broaden your horizons, Roosevelt urged. In today's vocabulary, we would say that Roosevelt was advising him to become interdisciplinary and to consider species not alone but in their full contexts in dynamic ecosystems. I think what he was encouraging him to do was to make connections between all of the different research that was happening and all the different fields of science and try to draw conclusions, use the power of his experience and insight on, let's say, like another level of thought, which I think Bibi did his best to uh, follow that encouragement, let's say. With Roosevelt's counsel now in his back pocket... Bibi would go on to make a major contribution to the still embryonic field of ecology. In 1916, he was in a South American jungle in what is now Guiana, where he pioneered the now common approach of marking off a small piece of ground and studying all the interactions of all the life forms within that limited space. Getting to Guiana was an adventure in its own right, and Bibi never missed an opportunity for research, no matter how awkward or odd, On one of his several trips to Guiana in 1918, he went after the famous floating mats of algal seaweed called sargassum. He had come prepared. Among the luggage which I take on board is invariably a large eight-pronged iron grapple with a long coil of rope. These the steward's eye askance when they place them in my cabin and hold whispered consultations as to their possible use. About the fourth day from the upper deck or the ship's bow, I begin to see floating patches of seaweed. I get my crude apparatus ready. We fasten one end of the coil of rope to the rail of the lowest open deck forward, and then I mount the rail, securing a good grip with legs and feet. As a cowboy on a fractious horse gathers the loops of his lariat for the throw, so I estimate my distance and balance myself for the propitious moment. The audience gathers. I make throw after throw in vain, and my audience is beginning to jeer, but the bow dips farther and farther away and I almost give up hope. Then I look up appealingly to the bridge and catch a twinkle on the captain's eye. Even as I look, he motions to the wheelman and the second succeeding dip of the bow slews it near the aquatic golden field. Still more, it swings to starboard and at last crashes down into the very heart of the dense mass of weed. The frothing water alongside is thick with a tangle of floating vegetation and it is impossible to miss. I throw and lean far over, dragging the grapple until its arms are packed full. Then, with all my strength, I draw up, hand over hand, leaning far out so it will not bang against the side and dump the dripping mass on the deck. For a few minutes, there is wild excitement. My audience dances and shouts with enthusiasm from the upper rails. Members of the crew appear and help me pursue agile crabs and flopping fish about the deck. Even the surly old mate roars down news of another batch of wheat ahead, and I curb my curiosity and again mount my precarious roost. One evening at the Guiana Research Station, Bibi was on his way to a swimming hole when he stumbled on a massive formation of confused army ants. They seemed to be traveling in a giant circle. This chance observation quickly became a multi-day study. I followed along the column down to the river sand, through a dense mass of underbrush, up the bank, back through light jungle. A few feet beyond the spot where their nest had been, the ends of the circle actually came together. It was the most astonishing thing, and I had to verify it again and again before I could believe the evidence of my eyes. It was a strong column, six lines wide in many places, and the ants fully believed that they were on their way to a new home. For most were carrying eggs or larvae, although many had food, including the larvae of the painted nest wasplets. Bibi quickly flagged this phenomenon for his team, and they began to observe it carefully, calculating the circumference of the circle to be about 1,200 feet. All the afternoon, the insane circle revolved. At midnight, the hosts were still moving. The second morning, many had weakened and dropped their burdens, and the general pace had very appreciably slackened. But still, the blind grip of instinct held them, On, 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 they must go. 
hour after hour, there was found no ecaton with individual initiative enough to turn aside an ant's breadth from the circle which he had traversed perhaps 15 times. Fewer and fewer now came along the well-worn path. Burdens littered the line of march, like the arms and accoutrements thrown down by a retreating army. At last, a scanty single line struggled past, tired, hopeless, bewildered, idiotic, and thoughtless to the last. Just a brief aside here. I can't help but think of the obvious, disturbing parallel, you know, to mass human delusions. The go-to metaphor for all of this is, of course, lemmings. Uh, Words out these days, though, that lemmings never deserve that reputation for being yes-men. Maybe maybe ants are the species to pin that on. Then some half-dead ecaton straggled from the circle along the beach and threw the line behind him into confusion. The desperation of total exhaustion had accomplished what necessity and opportunity in normal life could not. Several others followed his scent instead of that leading back toward the outhouse. And as an amoeba gradually flows into one of its own pseudopods, so the forlorn hope of the great Ekaton army passed slowly down the beach and on into the jungle. The fate of this confused ant migration remains uncertain, B.B. notes. Will they recover? Or is the colony done for, having lost its food and its progeny? These doomed ant odysseys are now known as ant mills, and the behavior has now been confirmed both in nature and in captivity. William Beebe was the first to discover it, and he did so quite by accident. Well, not really just by accident. He noticed and followed the ants because he was committed to understanding everything around him. Not just one species of plant or animal. Everything was interconnected for him. Everything mattered to him. And he had the temperament to drop everything else just to follow any promising clue to the grand puzzle of life wherever he found it, the various systems all swirling in constant motion, as in the case of this ant mill in Guyana. No matter where he went, the deeper realms of the ocean still beckoned. And the thrill of dredging or grappling for specimens, as he was accustomed to do, that just wasn't enough for him because he was acutely aware that every single specimen caught by these techniques had been ripped from a real context and the process shredded them to pieces. Creatures from deep down like this, they disintegrate because of the change in pressure. Furthermore, Just as he had learned to study the jungle holistically, he also wanted to see these sea creatures in action in their proper environment. Bibi credits a spider as the inventor of the diving bell. The diving bell spider. It lives almost its entire life underwater, breathing, hunting, reproducing, and resting inside a bell that it fashions from its silk. It supplies this place with air from bubbles it captures on its backside whenever it surfaces only briefly and then returns quickly to its underwater home. The idea of a human diving bell, well, that goes back to deep antiquity. Aristotle referred to the idea, but it wasn't until the 16th and 17th centuries that European inventors and maritime salvagers began with serious experimentation. It was always dangerous business. In 1775, a pair of Scottish diving bell inventors suffocated off the coast of Ireland. From diving bells, it was a short jump to diving helmets. The first successful diving helmet for humans was invented in 1823, originally as a smoke helmet to protect firefighters. By the end of that decade, it had been converted to a diving apparatus and was being used to salvage relatively shallow wrecks off the coast of England. In 1925, Beebe and his team began using such a helmet diving off the coast of Bermuda. Here's Brad Fox again. Eventually, they made them out of copper, copper and glass with with an air hose, and the hose would be attached to a pump that would be on either the shore or on a boat that would be continuously pumping air into the helmet And just because of the weight of the helmet, because it would be open at the bottom, 
it would keep this kind of bubble of air that would surround their head and allow them to go down and walk around the reef, check out what was going on in relatively shallow depths. What we now know as scuba, or self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, was invented in France in 1926. But it would take a while to perfect and then produce and distribute. So BB's explorations with tethered helmets open at the neck were still state-of-the-art in the late 20s. The major purpose of diving for BB remained the business of finding specimens for collections. He was a naturalist who worked for a zoo, after all, and you could say he was partially still a boy with a butterfly net, but with much greater ambitions and greater tolerance for risk. His approach to helmet diving just wasn't for the faint of heart. To get his fish specimens, BB used a weighted fishing pole with a dynamite blasting cap attached to the tip. He would explode the cap near a fish to stun it, then swoop in to net it. I was especially anxious to get some ripe eggs of a butterfly fish and to fertilize them. So I directed my attention to a pair of full-grown fish, the four-eyed species. I stunned both with the first shot, netted one of them, and was reaching toward the other when, out of the cloud of roiled water at my elbow, rose the head and neck of one of the largest green mores I have ever seen, also reaching for my fish. A section of the eel, well back along the body, was visible where there was an opening in the reef close to my knee, and at this I kicked with all my might. It was spontaneous resentment at the danger of losing my specimen, and I gave no thought to the possible result. This was perfectly satisfactory for the eel, which, judging from the size of its head, must have been eight feet long, withdrew even more quickly than it appeared. I salvaged my second butterfly fish and ascended the ladder. In pursuit of another specimen, he once had to fight off a five-foot shark. The shark was intent on getting there first to grab the fish and had squeezed in beside B.B. A moment later, the shark pushed ahead still farther, directly across my hand, and I saw that my puffer had slipped from the net and that the slanting eyes of the shark had perceived it. It was attempting to work itself past and against my leaning body. This was too much, and I shifted my grip on my net and stabbed down with the handle with all my force, directly on the rounded snout. A terrific swirl of water a few feet away showed where the tail fin had gone into reverse, The shark backed out, then turned upward and undulated over my head, the reef, and past the boat. The deep ocean presented itself to him in Haiti when he was in a bay and just doing these shallow dives with a helmet and an air hose, and then at some point got to the edge of the shelf of the island and peered down into the deep and was like, that's where I'm headed. He just was looking down as the shelf dropped off into the deep water and it somehow just called to him. (laughs) That was where he was going. And then that took over his imagination for the next, whatever it was, 10, 12 years. That was what he was obsessed with. So as he would travel around the country presenting his findings, he was always talking about how to get into the deep ocean. No one can point to the exact day when the temptation of deep-sea exploration became more than a mere fantasy in B.B.'s mind. The idea of doing it seems to have percolated intermittently over many years, reaching back quite possibly to that summer in Nova Scotia when he was a college student. In his book, Half Mile Down, about his adventures using the bathysphere, B.B. writes, Many years ago, I spent the best part of an evening with President Theodore Roosevelt, discussing ways and means of deep-sea diving. There remains only a smudged bit of paper with a cylinder drawn by myself and a sphere outlined by Colonel Roosevelt as representing our respective preferences. We worked out many details, but never recurred to the subject again. Roosevelt died in 1919, so if this account is accurate, that evening was many years before the notion of a submersible became feasible and real, You're listening to Constant Wonder. Our focus in this episode is William Beebe, one of the premier naturalists of the early 20th century. I'm Marcus Smith. If there had never been but one opal, one peacock, one sunset, and one butterfly, what glory of history and legend would accrue to each? 
men would have sworn great oaths of promise upon them and made them into sagas. But opals are worn for unlovely reasons upon unlovely hands. The man-given name is often deemed more important than the God-given idea of a butterfly. And a sunset, if not less than an interruption at dinner, is slighted because of the certainty of another on the following evening. There's a lot more B.B. tried to communicate about his personal awe for the world he loved. The isness of things is well worth studying, but it is their whyness that makes life worth living. Never idle, never bored, never timid, William Beebe betakes himself to the Galapagos Islands. He brings his diving helmet along, of course, for what is called the Arcturus Adventure, the first oceanographic expedition mounted by the New York Zoological Society. By this stage in his life, 1925, Beebe is a celebrity scientist and director of the Society's Department of Tropical Research, by sheer coincidence, he and his team are privileged to witness from their ship the eruption of a minor volcano. When a very wonderful thing comes into our lives for the first and perhaps last time, we betray our very birthright if we do not meet it with all the feeling and emotion and intellectual appreciation which is our human prerogative. He penned those lines for the opening of a chapter in his book about the expedition— the spectacle of lava glowing soon after midnight at sea was unforgettable. It tugged at him, he said, with the exact effect of a fire alarm on a schoolboy. He and his colleagues went ashore and nearly got themselves killed. One night, while watching the volcano from their ship, Bibi's team saw a meteor fall as if directly into the conflagration. The very next night, Bibi records... Nature sometimes takes us when we are immersed in the glory of some great sight and adds unexpectedly another, an auxiliary marvel for good measure, as a hint of the overflowing richness of the cosmic storehouse. Just before dawn, when three of us were watching silently with all our eyes, a mighty shooting star struck itself alight on the rim of our atmosphere, and in a blaze of white comet light fell silently and accurately into the center of the lava flow. After the identical happening of last evening, this appeared more than cosmic. It seemed intentional. For a few moments, I think the state of mind of all of us reverted to that of our distant forefathers, when signs and symbols and portents regulated all of life when the possible combinations of the temporal and spatial arrival of a shooting star be considered, it was assuredly an astounding thing that two such mighty meteors should have taken this exact course. New York Times, November 25th, 1926. BB to explore ocean bed in tank. Steel cylinder will withstand water's pressure at depth of mile or more. He will experiment with it next spring after his return from shark studies in Haiti. Dr. William Beebe, scientist and explorer, said yesterday that one of America's leading steel corporations was building for him a deep sea diving tank for exploring ocean bottoms at a depth of a mile or more. This tank, or cylinder, will be about a foot and a half in diameter and seven feet high. The steel walls will be about a quarter of an inch thick to withstand the terrific pressures of the water at great depths. It will have a window about seven by 12 inches in size, made of thick glass capable of withstanding a pressure of several tons to the square inch. In New York, Otis Barton read the article and was not amused. Barton was an independently wealthy engineer who had his own plans for building a deep-sea submersible, and he wanted to get there first. Barton knew that Beebe was on the wrong path. No cylinder-shaped tank could sustain the pressure at those depths. So there Barton is, 
injecting himself into BB's business with an unsolicited warning. Hey, man, that design is just not going to work, but I can help you. Let's work together. And the two men then entered into a collaboration. Barton would design and build and fund the diving sphere, with BB as the scientist. As the great chamber took shape, we found the need of a definite name. We spoke of it casually and quite incorrectly as tank and cylinder and bell. One day, when I was writing the name of a deep-sea fish, Bathotroctes, the appropriateness of the Greek prefix occurred to me. I coined the word bathosphere, and the name has stuck. You'd never say that the bathosphere was a comfortable conveyance. The two underwater explorers had to cram together on the frigid floor of a tiny round tank, unable to move or stretch, and holding that way for hours at a time. Brad Fox again. It is a steel sphere with some instruments inside. There's oxygen tanks. There is soda lime blowing around to regulate the air. Then there are these three pretty small openings that were supposed to be all windows. They were three-inch quartz panes, and one of them cracked the middle one, so it was plugged with steel. So they had essentially just these two small windows about smaller than your face. The bathosphere was under construction for a few years, and finally, in June of 1930, on a boat off the coast of Bermuda, Bibi and Barton prepared to climb inside. They unbolt the 400-pound door, and Bibi and Barton will crawl in, and there's footage of them comically shaking their feet as they scoot into the bathosphere like a couple of kids. Then they bolt it down, and the crew attaches the cable, and it is winched into the sea and lowered as the cable unrolls. And then on the deck of the ship, Gloria Hollister, who was the second scientist on the expedition, would sit with this notebook on her lap and a old simple telephone attached to her head. And the telephone line followed the cable and connected to the bathosphere and BB was there on the other end. And so as the bathosphere descended, BB would describe what he was seeing and Hollister would take note in the notebooks. So the first eyewitness account that we have of the deep ocean are those logbooks that Hollister wrote. They went lower and lower as they got more secure. Their first dive took them down to 800 feet, well below any previous human record. Awaiting them down there? A swirl of diverse animal life. The agreement was that Barton got to go along on every dive, which he nearly did. But Barton didn't participate in much observation. He did take a camera and film, but his photos never turned out. Mostly, Barton was content to be the one watching the instruments, noting depth records, basically being the engineer at the helm of a vessel with no propeller nor means of propulsion. And he rarely looked out the court's windows. The marvels B.B. saw were mostly seen by him alone. So people knew that there was life down there, but they had no idea how much life was down there. So that was an amazing surprise right from the beginning. Based on just what they had been able to bring up in nets, they had a certain idea, but they really had no idea how populated it was. There's one creature that they encountered called the bristlemouth, which was unknown. They kept encountering it. And then over the course of the 20th century, we realized that this small mid-ocean fish is actually one of the most populous creatures on the planet. How many are there? Until these dives, we only knew of bristlemouths through the fossil record. Today, we estimate their living population to be in the trillions. And in their aggregate, they may actually take sweepstakes for weightiest contribution to biomass in the entire ocean. Like so many fish at these depths, bristlemouths glow in the dark. And then there was also the phenomenon of bioluminescence. Seeing bioluminescent life for the first time in the deep ocean was, was absolutely mind-blowing to Bibi, and he considered it completely beyond words and was just astonished completely by that sight. Some creatures gave off steady light. Others blew up before his eyes like supernovas. If a certain type of shrimp was startled, it would squirt out a sudden chemical burst of light apparently designed to startle and blind a predator. Several times there were flashes of light from unknown organisms, so bright that my vision was confused for several seconds. For an instant, the shrimp would be outlined in its own light. 
vivid scarlet body, black eyes, long rostrum, and then would vanish, leaving behind it the confusing glow of fluid. All these displays of erratically erupting light were happening in deep darkness, thwarting Bibi's optical perception. Eyes don't adjust that quickly, obviously. He'd thought about vision since early in his career, and he had this idea of the oblique glance and what you would catch out of the periphery, looking at things a little bit indirectly. That fluid is meant to attract attention so that the shrimp can get away. If you're a predator, you go towards that thing and then the shrimp is off. So he had to train his attention to not be drawn in by the light and see instead what was lit up by it, which required attention to the periphery. William Beebe learned to soften his gaze with no direct focus to avoid the blinding effect, and in the resulting illumination, having avoided the momentary blinding flash, his peripheral vision could make sense of more. Over the years, he would come to use the phrase oblique glance in different ways, actually. It became one of his favorite concepts. He felt that he could often apprehend phenomena more successfully with an indirect approach to what he might be observing. In the South American jungle, he even extended this practice of his to the broad conceptualization of whole ecological systems rather than discrete or isolated species. Organisms came to be almost subordinate actors in a much larger staging of events. The best way to understand nature, B.B. argued, is to sneak quietly up a side aisle of the great green wonderland, looking obliquely at all things, observing them as actors and companions rather than species and varieties, softening facts with quiet meditation, leavening science with thoughts of the sheer joy of existence. It should be possible to achieve this and yet return to science enriched and with enthusiasm. This attention to the periphery ties in in an interesting way that really fascinates me, that as an ecologist, he was intent on helping people see how everything is connected with what surrounds it. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing this oblique glance thing, it's kind of saying, don't focus too narrowly. Exactly. The idea of interconnectedness was at the heart of his experience of the natural world and what he felt like was worth communicating. The idea of interconnectedness comes to bear on the siphonophore, which is a creature that they regularly saw on these deep ocean dives, a peculiar creature made up of genetically identical zooids. Brad Fox is talking here about siphonophores, colonies really, although they strike us as creatures. It's just that each member of the colony, though genetically identical to other members, somehow miraculously adopts a specialized task and function and form. They're analogous to cities, I think, all of which makes you think very hard about the implications of ecology, individuality, symbiosis, community. BB reported abundant siphonophores at every level from 100 to 3,000 feet down. He reached for poetic images to describe these marvelous communities. Vases of flowers, fountains, water wheels, narrow Christmas trees. Rarely, the entire outline was luminous, and a larger lighted mass at the top indicated the float, filled with its delicately adjusted amount of gas, exactly balanced to sustain its load at just the right level. The chains of polyps trailed behind for sometimes a full yard. Siphonophores are so frail and magical, Bibi reported, that they didn't survive dredging. Seeing them alive was the only way to see them at all. In our nets, we find only the half-broken swimming bells, like cracked crystal chalices, with all the wonderful loops and tendrils and animal flowers completely lost or contracted into a mass of tangled threads. Here, in their own haunts, they swept slowly along like an inverted spray of lilies of the valley. On and off, Otis Barton would again try to use his cameras, but all the while, Bibi would narrate telephoning to Hollister above through a wire, who took meticulous dictation. And in the course of time, they brought in a staff artist as well. 
this German-born illustrator named Elsie Bosselman joined the team in Bermuda, and she just was excellent. Bibi would come back with these descriptions of anglerfish, of green fangs and glowing tentacles and outlandish species that Bosselman had not seen. And so based just on his description, she would render them and they would work together until he was satisfied that it represented what he'd seen. These illustrations are kind of stylized, but the creatures are recognizable and they just have a certain uncanny beauty to them. And all of this communicated verbally from BB to the artist. Yeah. That's kind of like a police uh, effort there, you know? <laughs> Somebody just sees something and they have to describe it. Exactly. It is exactly like a police sketch artist. Yeah. Bibi's questing was not limited to jungle or sea, the Himalayas or Galapagos. His exertions played out on paper as well, writing to convey for posterity the unspeakable wonders he had witnessed. And in those writings, you get the sense that he would have probed deep into outer space, given the means. Whenever I sink below the last rays of light, similes pour in upon me. Throughout all this account, I have consciously rejected the scores of as-ifs, which sprang to mind. The stranger the situation, the more does it seem imperative to use comparisons. The only other place comparable to these marvelous nether regions must surely be naked space itself, out far beyond atmosphere, between the stars where sunlight has no grip upon the dust and rubbish of planetary air, where the blackness of space, the shining planets, comets, suns, and stars must really be closely akin to the world of life as it appears to the eyes of an awed human being in the open ocean one half mile down. Otis Barton continued to dive without BB in the years after their joint adventures in the bathosphere. He designed and built new iterations of the vessel and set new depth records. But BB, for his part, had seen enough. It had become daunting enough to try to describe what he had already experienced, and he even came to question the whole point of trying. Here, under pressure which, if loosened in a fraction of a second, would make an amorphous tissue of our bodies. Breathing our own homemade atmosphere, sending a few comforting words chasing up and down a string of hose. Here, I was privileged to peer out and actually see the creatures which had evolved in the blackness of a blue midnight, which, since the ocean was born, had known no following day. Here, I was privileged to sit and try to crystallize what I observed through inadequate eyes and interpret with a mind wholly unequal to the task. To the ever-recurring question, how did it feel? I can only quote the words of Herbert Spencer. I felt like an infinitesimal atom floating in illimitable space. No wonder my sole written contribution to science and literature at the time was, I'm writing at a depth of a quarter of a mile. A luminous fish is outside the window. Famous though he had become as one of the most gifted science communicators of his era, in that moment of inexpressible blue, then permeating blackness, half a mile down and more, he passed through some sort of nearly traumatic psychological transformation. Loneliness overcame him for feeling and seeing what no one else could see or feel except they should go through it with his senses and his sensitivities. It has to be mentioned also that many voices were skeptical of his reports. Those experiences down there dumbfounded even him, so how could any of that not be utterly lost in translation? After the 1934 dives, William Beebe bid goodbye to the bathosphere. He set his sights once again on birds and jungles. Who can be bored for a moment in the short existence vouchsafed us here, with dramatic beginnings barely hidden in the dust, with the excitement of every moment of the present, and with all of cosmic possibility lying just concealed in the future? You've been listening to Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. 
Brad Fox, whom you heard in this episode, is author of The Bathysphere Book, Effects of the Luminous Ocean Depths. William Beebe's words have been read for us by Brian Croxall. Eric Schultzka produced this installment of Constant Wonder with help from Mamie Teeples, Colson Darrington, Lily Jensen, and Brian Barba. Sound design was by Dallin Jepson. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.